and we're back. This is episode two of season two of the Shared Practices podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lowe. We took a little bit of a break, but we're back. I am super excited with the interviews we've recorded. I'm, I'm about 10 interviews into season two at this point. So this interview is an acquisition interview. We're going to alternate between systemization, which we did last time with Scott Luna, Dr. Scott Luna. And next time we're going to have a story. So this isn't an expert. This is actually in, in this case, it's two third year at the time dental students who bought a dental practice while they were still in dental school. And they're now getting to the end of their fourth year. But their story was super inspirational for me. And I think you guys are going to learn a lot of lessons from just everything that they went through. So we're going to alternate between systemization, acquisition, strategy with experts, and then stories of real life dentists doing acquisitions, doing partnerships, implementing systems in their practices. Today, we're going to hear from Reese Harper. We heard from him in season one, and he has his own podcast, the Dentist Money Podcast. Reese blows my mind every time I talk with him. He changed my perspective on debt versus liquidity last season. And in today's episode, we get Reese's perspective on an acquisition. And he actually, he dives into startups as well. But we go pretty deep. This is this is going to be a dense season because I want to give people enough tools to be able to evaluate potential opportunities and potential practices to acquire to even know if they're worth investigating further. And so we're going to hit this from multiple angles. So he's the first angle of, of this. How do I look at a practice? How do I digest the financials? How do I avoid problems and red flags? And lastly, in season two, we've got some actually amazing sponsors, Blue Sky Bio and Spear Education both agreed to sponsor us. I am grateful and honored. Please, if you are at all interested in either of these companies and the offers that we're going to have for them, reach out and take advantage of those offers because that tells them that someone's listening to this podcast and that they should continue to sponsor our podcast. So without further ado, here's Reese Harper. Okay, we have with us today Reese Harper from DentistAdvisors.com, and I think you'll know him from season one of the podcast, as well as his own show, The Dentist Money Podcast. And I was I was actually listening to your show earlier this week. I was in I'm in my residency waxing up a bunch of teeth and doing some lab work. And you put out some really hard hitting episodes recently with uh, Abernathy, Mark Costes, uh, it was like Morgan Cooper, Hammond. Hammond. Yeah, that's cool. Um, and I was like, man, Dennis Money Show is really good right now. And then I realized I'm going to be in Utah in a few days. I need to just crash Reese's place. And oh, thanks, man. I appreciate you uh, having me on your show. Well, well, thank you for letting me use your amazing studio. Here. Yeah, I do. I'm hearing some uh, things around the block occasionally, too, about your your podcast. Someone told me the other day in my neighborhood that they were listening into your show and that I was on there. And <laughs> and I, they didn't even know I was in dentistry. And so that's, that's hilarious. Cool. That's cool. No, yeah. that's awesome. Thanks. You must be getting famous on me. No, Don't no. Don't get too famous too quick. Not, not happening. Okay. <laughs> um, so... I've gotten a ton of emails from people saying, hey, I want to buy a practice now. Like, I'm looking at doing this. What are the next steps? And I feel like a startup versus an acquisition, a startup I feel like requires a little bit more business knowledge, maybe a little bit more risk um, if you do it the wrong way. I feel like an acquisition, you can be guided into that a little better um, without having to know everything and start everything from scratch and build it all from the ground up. So we made the decision to put acquisitions into season two. We're going to go into that right now. Um, and since you have a company that used to, or, you know, is, or is called acquire advisors, Mm -hmm. I have to give you a hard time because this is practice acquisitions. Let's, let's talk about acquiring stuff here. Okay. Okay. Can we do that Reese? Yeah, done. Okay. (laughs) So I would love I know, I know this isn't what you do all day, every day. You're not helping dentists acquiring practices. That's, that's totally fine. Yeah. Um, however, you are a business owner. You look at numbers of practices and financials all the time, every day. You are, are seeing hundreds of clients of their good decisions and their bad decisions and maybe their location and their practice. And, and these guys are successful and these guys aren't. You've got a, a perspective on entrepreneurship, ownership, numbers, financials, and you're kind of 
a step back from this whole process of acquiring a practice. So you don't have any like financial biases. You, you know, it's not yeah. like I would hire you or I wouldn't hire you based on how this interview went. Yeah. Um, it's totally anecdotal, but anecdotal. Know, I do have like uh, strong opinions about almost everything in life. It seems like awesome in which I am somewhat familiar. Okay. okay. So I'll try to give the opinions I can, but um, what I think you, the one thing you kind of hit on right at the beginning, you said, you think it's a little bit harder or easier to uh, – it's it's easier to acquire a practice maybe than start one up in yeah. terms of um, just being ready for that kind of initiative. Yeah. Is that, is that still fair? Yeah. Does that's, that feel that's, that way to you? That's my bias. That's kind of what I'm thinking. Where, and how – I'm just curious how that's been developed. You know, How have you arrived at that kind of feeling? Just kind of obser- observing or have you had a few people say this was hard for me or, um, or just seeing things? I, I would say – I guess it's the risk. Um, the fact that to do a startup, you have initially zero patients yeah. and you have to go from nothing to cash flow positive and profitable. And you've got all of these potential overheads that maybe you've backed yourself into because you bought a really expensive office and you hired this full staff yeah. and you thought you needed all the nice toys right up front. And so you can make it very difficult for yourself for the first year or two if you don't know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, Whereas with an acquisition, uh, you can walk into cash flow. You can walk into uh, patients that are on your books and and you've got a patient flow and a patient base. So I I feel like the risk level um, isn't as high Okay. Um, if done right. Here's like my um, observation having started one from scratch and not – I mean I've started my business from sure. scratch, didn't acquire it. But it's a fairly common practice in my industry to do acquisition. Okay. You know like uh, many financial advisors choose to acquire firms as opposed to starting their firm from scratch okay, and hoping sure. that someone comes knocking on the door. Right. It's really hard to get customers in my industry and people are very um, – much harder than dentistry actually to get people to migrate firms. Right. People use only between one and two financial advisors in their lifetime. Mm. So, you know, getting someone to make a switch is really challenging. So, I mean, it's, I was aware of that. Um, I don't know that consciously day one, I was like calculated in how I didn't acquire. I think I was probably just scared to get a big loan sure. and just thought, you know, just like a lot of dentists. Yeah. I've got some cash in the bank. I think I probably had like five grand or something. Nice. I thought, you know, maybe that will last me <laughs> for a week There you and, go. and I can find a customer. I mean, I really, I, I probably wasn't any more, pre- I was probably less prepared to do a startup than dentists are just because the financing for dentistry is much better than the financing for starting other kinds of sure. businesses. So you can go get operating capital at least for hundred thousand or a few hundred thousand you can borrow for your equipment and put it on a up to probably 25 year am schedule if you right. wanted to and so you can you can start a practice in dentistry or you can acquire one i think that that if you're a business person the way you'd analyze that choice would be every customer has a cost to to acquire it's called uh your your customer acquisition model or your cam okay so there's a there's a cost of acquiring a new customer and uh, you can either do that by buying customers, right, uh, from an existing business, right. or you can figure out a marketing strategy that lets you obtain customers at a lower cost than maybe it would cost you to buy one from someone. So in dentistry, a way to maybe make this make sense to people is you could advertise to find a new customer, and that would cost so much per customer yeah. if you're tracking it correctly. Or you could do a merger and buy someone's charts from another practice and just absorb their patients into your practice. Yeah. And you're going to be paying something for that too, right? right. So let's say I let's do a simple math and say it costs me a hundred thousand uh, dollars to buy a hundred patients. Okay. Okay. So if it costs me a hundred thousand dollars to buy a hundred patients, then how much am I paying per customer? I'm paying a thousand dollars per customer. Okay, you got good. It. Oh, yeah. That was hard. So if I'm going to pay a thousand dollars per customer, uh, to buy that patient base, maybe may I pay maybe maybe for five hundred thousand I buy two thousand patients. Mm. Maybe for a million I'm buying, you know, two thousand patients. Mm. Right? It's you just have to kind of look at what you're paying for how many customers you're buying, and then you can mm. determine what the cost of those customers are. Right? And so what you'll ha- what you'll see happen is a really healthy, mature, profitable practice will always cost more. Uh, to buy those customers. Okay. And uh, a startup from scratch costs, uh, the co- you have to pay for the pano, you have to pay for the chairs and sure. the TIs. 
So you might have 400000 of fixed costs for brand new everything and $0 for the patients. Okay. And you might pay a million dollars for the practice and you might end up with equipment that's not as good as the $400,000 sure. equipment that you would have started with. Right. So if I'm going to make this decision, I got to start making some assumptions and I got to say, if I went to the movie theater and I put up an awesome – you know, a uh, Facebook campaign sure. and I spent $5,000 advertising to the people in uh, Little Rock to for this movie uh, theater open house to go see Harry Potter and I spent $5,000 on that. Okay. How many customers could I potentially buy for my practice? Okay. Because okay? when you're starting out, you're lean and scrappy and you don't need a lot of money. Hopefully you didn't get a mortgage yet and you don't sure. have a house and you don't have a car. You're just walking. Just kidding. <laughs> but if you keep your lifestyle pretty scrappy and you're just renting, meaning you can keep all your cash, any operating capital that you get from that first it's loan. It's not tied up. It's not tied up. Then you could say one $5,000 movie bought me 30 new patients. Okay. Uh, so my cost of customer acquisition, you know, was somewhere, you know, I'm gonna uh, let you do this one, you know, so let's do a little bit better math for you. Okay. <laughs> so if I spend $5,000, I only got 10 patients out of it. Ooh, okay. Paying 500 bucks. It's 500 bucks, but that was still, still cheaper than the one that I would have. i maybe it's cheaper than the one I'm considering buying. Sure. So if I can pay, if I can do that once a month for 12 months, to get to where I, you know, I have 500 active patients in 12 months, you know. Okay. Because, or I get 600. If I'm getting 50 in a month, you know, I'll have 600 in a year and I'll have 1,200 in two years and sure. I'll have 1,800 in three years by just doing a movie once a month in different parts of my major metro city. Right. Or maybe I do a barbecue or maybe I do something like that. Sure. The question in my mind, I know it's more complicated and I'm not saying this is easier, um, but if you have a mind for it and you are interested in thinking this way, then if you took $200,000 of cash and you spent $5,000 every time to buy, you know, those 50 new patients, then could you buy enough could you buy new patients or get enough new patients to be less than the million dollar practice you're about to buy? Right. Because you know, in the scenario where you could take that you get $400,000 worth of equipment debt and maybe you get $200,000 worth of operating capital and use all that money to buy new patients through good targeted marketing. You only owe six hundred thousand dollars, and you have brand new equipment. You have a, a beautiful new location. Mm. You have a full practice. The difference is, it took you two to two and a half years to get there. Right. So you had to eat whatever overhead you have every month until you break even. That could be as much as seven or eight grand a month. Uh, you know that you you need of, to, to live personally, and you might have another seven or eight grand a month of money that you needed to pay the staff payroll. But right out of the gate, you know, month one and month two, you won't have anything, but month three, you probably will. And month four and five and six, you're, you're going to start losing less money every month because you're going to start seeing that new patient flow come in. And, and if you're going to do, if you're going to be objective about it, I do think it'll be more painful to do it that way. Right. But you're also able to control the location, um, the exact street corner um, that you want to be in the exact city um, you can be very targeted about sure. where you want to place your visibility. Um, you know, everything you have a lot of control over it. Yeah. So from my perspective, I wouldn't say it's a no brainer to buy an existing practice because I pick up a lot of baggage with an existing practice. I pick up staff that have certain habits that I don't necessarily uh, want to adopt. I pick up a location that I can't control. I right. pick up, um, just a lot of, you, you pick up a lot of baggage. This, this is awesome. Cause so, in my mind, the decision between an acquisition and a startup has typically been an availability question. Yeah. So are there available practices that are a decent um, purchase price for what I'm buying and, you know, that look attractive? And if there's not, then, you know, okay, well, we've got to do a startup. Yeah. Um, I have never heard anyone phrase it like that where they say, well, how much are you paying for the building and the equipment or not necessarily building the equipment and the practice versus patients and how much would that cost if you were to do that yourself yeah. from scratch? Because a lot of times what you'll see is you're buying a practice that's 15 years old. It's got a piece of junk pano. Sure. You've got destroyed chairs and ops. Your front desk looks like crap. I mean, the, the place is a dive, but it's got a large amount of collections. Sure. So you got to come in and you got to rehab the place and spend two or 300 anyway to get it looking decent where you could have found a new leased location where the landlord was willing to put $40 a square foot into TIs. You might have to come up with a little bit, but you've got a 
gorgeous looking place in a brand new building that and, and brand new equipment. And the practices aren't comparable, right? right. They're not the same practice. It's, it's the practice you want that you've chosen yeah. versus the inherited practice that you're yeah. you're fixing and to I'm hopefully always, something. Yeah, I'm good. always willing to pay a little bit more for design. Okay. So for me, like if I had a better designed practice, more efficient flow, a better location, better visibility, like I'd pay a premium for that. And yeah. generally, the only way you can, you know, I this goes against what you're going to hear from almost anybody. Like I know I don't hear anyone say you should do a startup. Like I don't hear anyone say that. Right. No one says like startups are the way to go. I'm just saying from having done a startup, I'm incredibly grateful that I've built it from the ground up. I did have to borrow money and there were a lot of months when I sure. ran it into the hole. I went to the SBA and I probably rent through $200,000 plus in initial just debt that I had to like eat because working capital type. for myself to live on. Right. Okay. I mean, you know, get, getting equipment in space and staff and, sure. and payroll and salaries. Like, you know, some of that stuff can be paid for through financing. Like equipment can be paid for through other debt. You're going to need to eat into debt just to live if you go that route. Right. And you can't, you gotta be okay that realizing that's not the, a bad decision. It's just, a, it's an alternative choice you're not moving in the wrong direction. Yeah, you're not moving in the wrong direction. You would have debt. borrowed an extra seven hundred grand to right. buy that location. Or, right. Now, if you could go in, the, the, the flip side, and people listening to this, I know what some people are thinking. They're thinking, well, I could go and buy a practice that's like doing 200000 a the collection. Fixer upper. A little fixer-upper. And my, my rationale with that one is there's a reason she's a fixer-upper. <laughs> and the market is generally a pretty good um, indicator of like what something should be sure. priced at. Like. You know, if if I'm if I'm doing two hundred thousand, it's, it's not a diamond in the rough. It's probably yeah, a it's jumper. the rough. It's the rough. It's just in the rough. <laughs> there's no diamond. And so does does the is it all the old? Is it the doctor's fault that the practice was sure. only doing two hundred? Was he incompetent? Was it a location issue? That's that's hard to diagnose, right? And I've seen a lot of people buy existing practices and. You, you, they get stuck at a collections level. There's you know? kind of a ceiling to it. It's like they they, they it was doing two fifty and it's a fixer upper and now it's stuck at five. Okay, five twenty. Okay, and they can't get to eight so, nine. So to grow that million. to eight nine one point two, it's it, not about the it's about the location. It's something in that market that. Right. And um, I, I, that's not always the case, but I it's just I don't. If I was going to buy a practice, I would buy a healthy, profitable, expensive. <laughs> Highly like visible, sure. great location, guys killing it's it, bustling, practice. yeah. And I don't care. I'm going to finance that over 20 years, sure. And I, I bought the best thing possible in a community. I don't like the fixer up for strategy. I don't. I don't think that's efficient. I think you don't know what you're getting right. a lot of times. And yeah, I'm not saying it's not been done and not been done well. But I, the people that I know who've been more successful, it's been buying a good location with. Um, great collections or they've started something. Okay. And I don't mind startups. I just don't mind it. And awesome. So I think you should, I think most people should probably just stay open minded to what, what they might be able to, to pull off starting a business and it's, it'll kill you for two or three years, <laughs> right. but you'll have less debt and you'll, you, it'll be a high quality asset and all that energy and effort you put in will build equity in a way that you wouldn't have been able to get otherwise. So. It's, it's worth considering. Well, so. and um, I think Graham Dursley on uh, he's a de- he's a prosthodontist who bought a practice out of his prosthodontic residency, and he talked about how there kind of was this ceiling, and he got out of this practice within a couple of years. He he did essentially flip it. You know, he bought it, took it to where it could go, and then realized like I can't go any further being in this complex that's like in the back here and it's with all these other professionals and there's no visibility yeah and you know did his own scratch start um and has done a couple others since and he's one of the few that i've seen that's kind of uh expressed that sentiment that um you know sure it's great but you really can can get stuck at a certain point if you don't have control over everything from the start yeah um, yeah. which is, which is the exact opposite of what we're talking about. We're trying to acquire practices, not startup <laughs> practices. That's season four. Ten four. Uh, okay, no, so. no, no, no. Um, so. This is awesome. Um, one of the questions I've gotten, or one thing I've heard voiced recently, someone posted, um, what, what do you feel like the market is right now? What do you feel like the climate is right now? And 
um, the feedback that they were getting was that it's kind of a, a seller's market, you know, and, and that it's easier to sell your practice than it is to, to find one to buy. So mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on that when you hear market conditions of, of practice acquisition? So in, um, in 1976, um, I believe that's the year, there's a guy named um, Eugene Fama. He's a okay. uh, PhD at the University of Chicago. Sure. And he came up with this thing called the efficient markets hypothesis. It's the EMH. Everyone should act as if prices are fair. Okay. Um, and that he's speaking specifically as it results to it relates to stocks right. and mutual funds and prices in a public market. Um, but that bias, like for me, transfers to like other segments. Sure. I think everyone should behave as if prices are fair. Um, I don't like the idea of timing markets. I don't. Sure. I, I let other conditions kind of tell me if it's the right time to buy an asset or not. And so I think the right time to buy a practice is when you feel capable uh, clinically and when you feel like um, you have the financial resources and the kind of mental bandwidth sure. to tackle it. You're ready uh, to meaning do that. I want to see a little bit of liquidity. You know, somebody it'd be, it'd be nice to have at least you know, six months to yep. 12 months worth of liquidity yep. um, ready to go and, and make sure that you feel clinically like you can handle most anything that, you know, comes your way. So to you, that would be more important than market conditions, quote Yeah, unquote. by far. Um, and that would be the real indicator of, of when to buy. Yeah, because if you wait two years for market conditions to cool off, all you're doing is waiting two more years to obtain equity in a practice that could have grown and sure. given you more net worth. Um, you could have reduced the debt on the practice two years in a row instead of, you know, waiting and just getting paid as an associate for those two years. You could have built inroads in the community with referring doctors that will pay exponential dividends over the next twenty years. Right. Like the sooner you can get started, and 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 get that clock ticking, the wealthier you'll be at an earlier age. Okay. It's just a question of when you're ready. You okay. know. And I wouldn't let the market conditions affect it. Behave as if prices are fair. And don't let prices be the dictate dictator of when you're ready. Okay, you know that's no. how I look at it. When when I saw that post, you know, people tend to be like, "Oh, well, it's a bad time to buy because all of these corporate chains are coming in buying practices yeah. and all this stuff." So either I have to do a startup, or maybe I should just stay an associate. Or, uh-huh. um, I think there will always be there will always be something out there, and if you are looking for a practice to buy and maybe you'll have to expand your your demographics your your range of options yeah uh, maybe you're looking a little further away than than where you were initially um, eventually there's gonna be something that you can buy yep um, I think I think if you can do a little bit of effort to like if it were me I'd set up um, a landing page on the internet yeah explaining who I was what I was doing that I was looking for an acquisition and then I would send out um, direct mail to you know, thousand people in the community, pointing them to my website and telling them to fill out this form if they were interested in talking to me about you know selling their practice to me, I, and I would just you know spend five grand and make sure everyone in the whole state knew that I was looking, because a lot of these people don't, um, you know, most practices never get listed, and you know yeah, they change hands off market, and that's that's a completely different topic of like. This episode is brought to you by Blue Sky Bio. I reached out to Blue Sky Bio because not only do they offer some pretty amazingly priced implants, but also because of their planning software, their customer support, their reputation online for just being an amazing company. I connected with them through Dr. Corey Glenn, who was a friend of mine that I met at a dental town meeting. So here's a little clip from my interview with Corey that I'll be releasing later on. But I wanted to hear your perspective of like, how did you find out about Blue Sky Bio and what have they allowed you to do in your career that that is unique to them versus other implant companies? Yeah, so I mean, as as far as their products, their products are, are just excellent. I mean, I, I have a slide in my lectures that everybody always gets a laugh out of that says, you know, everybody's implants integrate, some just integrate a whole lot cheaper. Right. And so we know at this point what works in implants. Uh, we know what surfaces work. We know uh, many of the design aspects that work. So there's no monopoly on making a well-designed implant that's going to integrate and that's going to you know do well in the body. So sure. practicing where I do in a lower income area, you know, I realized early on if I was going to be doing many implants, 
uh, that I would have to do them affordably. Blue Sky Bio offers high quality implants at fair prices. If you want to be able to do the dentistry that your patients deserve, you need to be able to provide it affordably. As an offer to our listeners, Blue Sky Bio is providing a $200 discount when you buy at least $500 worth of product or $250 off any implant starter package. This isn't $30 off of a $700 product. This is $200 off of $500, 40% off. To take advantage of this offer, mention the Shared Practices podcast in the additional instruction box during checkout. What you see listed on your your state association and maybe a few brokers listings, those are a few practices, sure. Yeah. But there's a ton more practices that change hands than ever get listed. Yeah, especially if your tone on that letter that goes out is like, hey, I'm not going to nickel and dime people. I'm a fair markets guy. Practices have values. Those can be appraised. And I'm I, I just wanting to pay the fair market price for what sure. a practice is worth. Just talk in those kind of terms so people know. I mean, just don't be a, don't try to nickel and dime someone over 25 grand or 50 grand on an acquisition. I mean, okay. at the end of the day, it's like a hundred bucks a month. Do you want to burn the bridge of the selling doctor because you tried to like negotiate hard over a hundred dollars a month? Or do you think maybe patients are going to call him for the next two or three years and ask him what he thinks about right. the guy that bought the practice? And if you try to nickel and dime the guy or gal that, you know, you just bought the practice from, then how incented are is that person to say yeah, it's a great person? I mean, if if, you, if the tone that you buy, if the tone that you kind of use in talking to selling yeah. doctors or is the right tone and it's respectful and it's that you seem like the person that they would want to sell to, sure. uh, you're going to get a bigger audience right away, and you're going to get a lot of endorsement post sale. And so for me, I would just make sure that I blanketed and canvassed any state that I wanted to live in. And I probably wouldn't let the state drive the decision. Like I don't go live in the Midwest because fees are higher there. I go live where I want to live and right. I blanket and canvas that area um, for opportunities. And then I deal with the fee schedule of that community because okay. I've got clients that are in, you know, downtown Seattle, downtown New York, you know, uh, California and Orange County and Utah and rural spots in the Midwest and you know, there's always a different fee schedules and reimbursement rates are different everywhere and people struggle with fees differently. But the the people who build the right practices in the right markets um make great money. Okay. And it's and and the money the money you make in each market is usually offset by other factors. Like if Seattle's fee schedules are three times as good as a competitive spot in in uh Phoenix, then Cost of living is probably three times as expensive there too. Okay. And staff hourly rates are probably a lot higher and lease rates on my building are a lot higher. And I'm going to net a similar it balances amount. balances it out. And my mortgage is going to be higher. Like if I'm making half as much in a rural or in a heavily densely populated area in – in, a, in in Phoenix, yeah. my my real estate costs might be a third of what they are in New York, sure. or a fourth. And sure. so can I be happy and live and retire just fine? Yeah, as long as you like living in Phoenix, right? right? Like like where you, you know, love where you live and make sure that you could see yourself there um, long term because you don't want to take the trade-offs that came from one market and then relocate to a different market once you're kind of done mm. because sometimes your lifestyle and expenses and income and retirement plan are based, are based on living on in that market, that geographic Interesting. zone. And okay. so if you relocate from Phoenix and go retire in Orange County, you might have a little bit of a shell shock in terms of comfortable retirement sure. income because you needed an Orange County You don't County have an accurate gauge of how yeah. you would live in that area. Yeah. And, um, and the retirement you were able to build up was based on a fee schedule from another market. Sure. And, you know, it doesn't always translate. Huh. But if you kill it in a small market, you can always relocate and retire somewhere that might be a little more expensive. But, sure. you know, that's just something to think about. That's why I like people like loving where they live, you know, and just owning that living there. So. And, and and that's great to hear because I've also heard a lot of people say, oh, go rural, go rural, go open a practice or buy a practice in the middle of nowhere and you're going to crush it. And and then you're going to be way more set for everything else. But like a lot of people don't want to live rural. Yeah. And yeah. Um, that's 
if you've got the student loans that are worrying you to the point where you know you're never going to be able to sleep at night and that's the only way that you can figure out that you want to go buy a rural and open a practice there and pay down those loans and yeah. then move. But I still – I feel like that feels a little weird to me. Some people – some and I've had clients that have relocated to rural after spending 10-plus years in major metro. Okay. They just struggled – like from, for that, from their perspective, they weren't happy maybe with the income that they earned. You know, it wasn't enough money. Okay. Um, it might have been to one person, but to them it wasn't. Sure. So maybe one person's making a half million dollars a year and that doesn't feel like enough money. Okay. And then someone else in a room. I'd love that, by yeah, the way. Yeah, that was a good problem to have. So I, I can think of several examples where, you know, it, it just the expectation someone had for their um, net worth and the amount of money they wanted to earn um, couldn't be met by their the market they were mm. in. And so they picked up and left and they went rural or they went uh, – And did it work out for them? Some, some rural go metro, right? Okay. Same back and forth. Um, in many cases, uh, depending on the rural market you move to, fee schedules w- will tend to be higher. There will be less insurance penetration. And if there is, it's pretty good reimbursement rates. Um, you're going to make more money. Okay. Um, the trade-offs are worth it to some people. You know, they get out there and – like I grew up rural, so for me, I love it. You know, I could live rural, but – I. You know, I've grown to appreciate Metro as well. Sure. Like I married a girl from Orange County and um, she, you know, it would be really hard for her to live on a farm out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah. You know, she appreciates it and we like visiting. Sure. But it's not something that was like in her wheelhouse. Yeah. So for me, it's like it affected my decision whether I wanted to go move rural. Yeah. I probably could make a lot more money as a rural financial advisor too, right? I mean – for real? Do you, yeah. think, do you think it translates? Well, there's a lot of there's 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 very scarce there's scarcity in okay. some of those markets, yeah. and so in some of these kind professions, of the same idea. like a high a high end profession like dentistry, orthodontics, financial advisory, legal, you know, you'll you'll have twenty or thirty customers that are that are uber wealthy people, mm. and those you know, like I, I have farming friends that you know have forty thousand acres of land, sure, you know, and they're. They're deca, deca, deca millionaires, right. you know, and, and so you'll have those customers and those customers pay a disproportionately high amount of money. Right. You could probably earn quite a bit, okay. if not more than you might in a competitive rural area. Sure. I'm competing with PhDs all the time or, you know, you have a much more competitive environment, both in dentistry and, uh, you know, in any other industry in, okay. in metro areas. So in my opinion, you, you sometimes can make more money in rural and if it fits your lifestyle – um, and you don't mind it and it fits your, your family's lifestyle. Um, and you, and you could see yourself even retiring there potentially, yeah. then that could be great. Sure. Um, but you don't have to retire rural either. Some people can go and live rural and they don't mind relocating. For me, that would be hard. I, I, and in most of the people I do know who go, who go practice rural, eventually once the kids are raised, they move back, Okay, you know, or they relocate to a place where they don't have to travel quite as far to go see a play or, right. you know, go to a, a basketball game or, sure. you know, go to the mountains. I don't know. You got to be able to spend that money somewhere. Yeah. And so you relocate. And then for me, I really like roots. And so it's hard to relocate after having built friends for 20 to 25 sure. years. And then you kind of shift and go and start over. Yeah. Um, this is this is great because these are the kind of questions that you got to be thinking about in terms of, where am I going to do an acquisition, a startup, you know, yeah. put my roots down. Buying a practice is a long-term decision yeah. that is going to have second order, you know, effects on all these other areas of your life. Yeah. Going um, rural doesn't always pay more, but okay. in general, that's probably true. It okay. probably does. That's, you that's, know? A, that's a trend. Yeah. I, it just depends. Like rural to me though is like, you know, you are the provider for 60 to 80,000 people. Okay. Like that's rural. Right. Not you're one of 10 people in 50,000 right. people. Right. You know, that you are the provider right. for a like pretty a whole large county, county of yeah. people, you know, more than 10,000. So right. 50,000 plus. Sure. Right. Um, and I, I think, you know, GPs can survive on a lot less density than that, but that's like, that's where you're going to see lights out kind of production. Sure. And, especially when it comes to some specialties. Okay. You know, I just think that I have clients in metro areas that do really, really, really well and make just as much money as the people in rural. Okay. Um, but a lot of it, I, I think if you're going to do a startup, man, you can't, I mean, a startup, a rural startup is a, ch- a little bit challenging. Okay. Right? Just because you don't have, 
you don't have the population density to draw from, and it makes it a little bit slower to build. Okay. But with a great reimbursement schedule and 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 very little competition, it, it you can do really well in even as short as twelve months. So it just depends on like just going rural isn't the answer. I mean, r- rural is a guideline, but the real like substantive part of it is producer to population ratio. Like that's the sure that's, that's kind of the the classic hallmark yep. um, mm-hmm. indicator. So I want to I want to ask you something about this because you've mentioned this several times. The fee schedule. I think a lot of new docs who are, you know, just been an associate at one place and aren't seeing the overall, you know, aren't negotiating insurances. Mm-hmm. They aren't dealing with uh, all of the sides of collections that they should be eventually as an owner. Maybe they, they wouldn't even know like what is a high or a low fee schedule. What would be a resource for people if we just said, don't, don't, put an inordinate amount of attention on fee schedules. But yeah. if you wanted to be informed and yeah. understand where they are and be able to compare um, both you know, markets and, and areas, yeah. like where does that information exist? Uh, the insurance companies will have it, right? Okay. Uh, if you go on, like if you listen on my show, the Dennis Money Show podcast, I've done like four episodes on reimbursement firms. Right. Like so Ben Tunier, you just did one with. Ben will have great resources. Okay. Um, Mike Alder, um, so would that make sense to reach out if you're looking at doing a startup or an acquisition would, in the area, yeah. reach out to these insurance guys that that's- you find insurance negotiations, like professionals they'll they'll have great, uh, they'll have good data. Okay. Um, you could also r- reach out directly to carriers, okay. you know, um, if you know which carriers are in a given area, sure. um, a lot of times you'll find that they're, they're open to that kind of dialogue and so cool. No, yeah. that's that's awesome. And I don't think anyone's ever expressed that as a point of data that you should have going into this this process. Yeah. Okay, so let's shift topics here for a second. One of the concerns with buying a practice or starting up a practice, but we're still talking about acquisitions, is avoiding a lemon. So mm-hmm. avoiding a practice that you really have set yourself up for failure. Yeah. Um, do you have any stories or specifics where you've seen a dentist buy a practice and just struggle? And it was totally because they bought the wrong practice yeah. and they didn't realize what they were getting themselves into. That's tough because, you know, a lot of the kit situations that I've seen it fail didn't, I, I don't know how to analyze whether it was the dentist or the, or the location. Yeah. Yeah. No. You know, if I'm honest about it, it's, some people are going to be successful no matter where you yeah, put them. Yeah, like the people that I know who have failed like miserably, I've seen people come in behind them and not, and not fail quite as much, sure. right? So locations are a strain for sure, um, but I wouldn't let that um, – the story about that dog practice that no one's ever been able to get off the ground like deter me completely because sure. I'm a very like individualist thinker and I feel like – the right marketing, the right personality, the right friendliness, the right care. Someone loves their patients more than you do. You know, they're going to succeed, sure. right? And 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 but as a general rule, yes, I have seen people, multiple people, try in a location and have that fail. Okay. Um, I in 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 my experience, sometimes that that is more common uh, with specialists um, because you might see. Uh, multiple specialists in an area that's very uh, over-serviced. Like I've seen pedo locations where you've got, you know, five to seven pediatrics all kind of competing for too much, uh, too small of a market. Okay. And that makes it just really hard for multiple people. You you want to see low collections and declining collections as a red flag. Okay. You, you don't want to look at that as a positive thing, like maybe I can get a deal. Sure. Um, th- there's a reason and, and you, when things are tapering off. That's not like, Oh, he's just an old guy and he's yeah. just kind of slowing down. And I wouldn't let collections tell me whether this thing was tapering off. Okay. I would let new patient flow per month. Tell me whether this was tapering off. And I would look at, you know, people just ask for collections history, you know, that's mm. for day charts for three years. They want to see those, but I would look at new patients for the last three years by month or new patients by month for the last two years. Okay. That tells me, do people still refer? Uh, do people think this doctor is capable? Okay. Have they lost interest in coming in? Um, if there's no new patients or you know less than ten new patients per month for like the last three years, or you're at zero to five, I mean, the, the new patient flows much because he could be doing like 
three or four full mouth restor- restoration cases and it, affle- it affects your collections trajectory and you not, you don't even realize that you know that that that's not really a, a sign of po- that's not really a positive sign of right. growth i mean you just want you want a healthy hygiene department um that'd be another indicator like just as a financial person like i don't know anything about practice management i mean i know nothing sure. but i probably know more than some <laughs> yeah just because i look at numbers okay yeah. i don't claim to be that person but if i look at like a collections um uh, if i look like at a day chart and i and i see that hygiene is like 10% of total production, like that's not a good sign to me. Um, you, I, I, I'd like, like if somebody's collecting like one, three, you know, or one, four, okay. I'd like to see 400 to 500 to potentially as much as 600,000 of that coming from, from hygiene. Okay. And, and if you don't have a healthy hygiene, like to total collections ratio, that means something like, it's it's highly dependent on the doctor's existing uh, clientele. You know? Well, and so that was that was one of the things that I've heard before is this idea of it's hard to transfer relationships. Mm-hmm. And so if you've got a fee for service doc who's doing high end rehabs, who's doing procedures that maybe even if you could do those procedures, but you just don't have the relationship capital with those those people. Um, and they've been getting these letters from insurance companies every month that yeah. they should be switching providers because he's out of network and they're paying fee for service. Um, you can lose a lot of patients and a lot of that collections from those big cases that he was doing and now you're not doing them. So that would be maybe one specific circumstance. If it's a fee for service, high end practice with low hygiene, yeah, that's kind of a red flag. Yeah. Of okay, is this going to transfer well? Well, yeah. I just like to see. A healthy hygiene department. Okay, that that tells me that I'm going to be able to sell dentistry in that practice probably pretty effectively. Okay, you know, if I see um, a, 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 like assisted hygiene functioning well, yeah, I I know that I can probably produce effectively in that environment. Okay. So for me, that's a good indicator. Cool. If I see a doctor doing his own hygiene, it's tough to like want to. Pay, I mean, it's tough to want to pay a lot um, for that because I. I, there's just so much work to do, mm. um, you know, at that point, you know, and any kind of income that's being made at that practice is, uh, it, it's just not really, pro- it's not profitable yet. I'm, there's no leverage. The hygiene department's the only place where the doctor really gets leverage. You know, it's okay. the only place you can be entrepreneurial uh, truly in, in dentistry, you know. Yeah, have someone else producing that's working for you yeah. that you don't have to do that production. Yeah, and a lot of times, too, you want to look at the financials of these practices. Like, let's say the hygiene department is producing 400000 but the payroll for that hygiene is like 310 Okay. Like, you'll see, like, a payroll that is almost three-quarters to 80% of what the hygiene collections are. Right. And And that's just like... I've got, you know, I'm blowing out profitability because I'm, I've got some weird bonus system or, you know, I've got hygiene assist. I've got assisted hygiene that is like really inefficient. I've right. got too much support. You know, they're, the hygienists aren't doing enough. Okay. Um, they're depending too much on everyone else. You know, the, the, so don't just look at how much money is being produced by the doctor versus the hygienist. Also look at of the money that's produced by the hygienist, how much of that is disappearing into to payroll. Yeah. If I would, I wouldn't want to be much over 50%. Like okay. you'd want to kind of be right around that ratio. Okay. If you're less than that, it's probably healthy. If you're more than that, it's that's kind of a red flag. Yeah. And so I know you, you, you'll see that a lot. So it's like, I got this really healthy hygiene department. We're killing it on hygiene. And then, that there's no profit from that. They're not making money. It's and then just you go in. Bodies going good through. Good luck telling your hygienist that they're going to take a pay cut. Right. You know, they're probably they're. I just you know you'll see hygienists making a crazy amount of money. Yeah. Uh, and they need significant pay cuts. Okay. And then you can't you can't come in and do that. So you you just don't want to inherit bloated staff. Yeah. And that's another thing. Like I would really look at the financials of a practice and know, you know, if for every dollar that comes in. The doctor should be getting twenty five to thirty cents on that dollar okay. just for producing it. Right, that's okay. for being the doctor. Yes, and I should at the after all my overheads covered, I should have fifteen to twenty cents left. Okay, so I got fifteen to twenty cents left on every dollar, and I'm getting twenty five to thirty cents of it personally. Right. So which which means I could get maybe up to a total of fifty percent of the whole collections going to me if I was a single producer getting paid as the producer and there was 20% left. Like I get paid 30 and I keep 20. That's a total of 50 that ends up to me. But don't think of 
that you have to think of it separately. Like you have to think of what am I getting paid as a producer? Right. And I should be getting paid 25 to 30% of what I'm producing. And then I should have 15 to 20% left over of all my collections in profit. And that is a total of, that's where you hear people say I'm at 50% overhead or something. Sure. Like, well, I don't know how, a lot of people on the, like students, and so they talk about overhead. overhead yeah. Like, oh, I'm at 50% overhead or I'm at 40% overhead. It's yeah. like, that's wow. That's like the holy grail. Yeah. yeah. But um, really it's a little more, that I think that's a not a healthy way to think about it. I, I would think about it as what am I getting paid as a producer and what is true profit true left profit. over. And that should, you should have a goal of a GP, of a single producer GP to, to get above 50% between both of those, you know? Right. That'd be healthy, but... Okay, so um, I'm trying to break this down and, and make it all, like, usable and, and memorable, so... Not a chart. We don't have charts here. <laughs> right. It's hard to do <laughs> charts over audio. Um, so look at production of hygiene to doctor and profitability of hygiene as well as the practice overall. Yeah. Um, how hard is it to tell profitability of hygiene and how profitability of the practice overall? If I were to reach out to a broker to yeah. so say that, you know, you Reese Harper are now a dentist yeah. and you're looking at buying a practice, but you have all of your knowledge right now. Mm-hmm. Um, is it hard to tell? Yes. If it's actually profitable. Yeah, it's really tough. So how do you do that? Whenever a patient walks in that's kind of a train wreck, I get both excited and scared at the same time. I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be an awesome case. I take some impressions, I take some photos, and then I think to myself, oh crap, where do I start? That's where learning from people who have done this before really comes into play. Fortunately, one of those people is Dr. Frank Spear, and his course on facially generated treatment planning is one of the fundamental courses that I've heard consistently, you need to take this class. If you haven't taken this course and you don't understand how to treatment plan these complex cases, you're going to get yourself in trouble. Here's a quick preview from his course. But in general, the people we struggle with are people whose teeth are out of position. Either the teeth are out of position, the bone's out of position, the gingiva is out of position, or they have occlusal problems. And I'll give you a simple example. If you have a patient with significantly worn anterior teeth and they're in occlusion, I promise you the teeth are in the wrong place. The teeth either had to erupt to maintain the occlusion or the patient had to lose vertical dimension. In either case, the teeth are in the wrong place. Now, what facially generated treatment planning really does is it simply systematizes the sequence in which we develop a treatment plan. It says basically we need to establish tooth position first, gingival levels next, occlusion after that, and then we can move on into more traditional elements of treatment planning. So what I want in this course, they turn a complex clinical situation into a system, a recipe, a cookbook that you can follow. I love this course, and if you want access to this and hundreds of other amazing clinical online courses that you can access from the convenience of your own home, go to spireducation.com and request a guest pass. Well, see, the de- the, the you got to know how to – I mean, you need someone who knows right. how to dive through it. And a broker – sometimes practice brokers are really competent. Like I have some that I know that know how. Like Porter, like yeah. Matt Porter. Porter could dig through it and figure it out. Right. Like all this stuff, it makes sense to him. Now, some people are – some of maybe a few um, like of the national reps. Yeah. Like a, a, and I won't throw anyone under the bus, but there might be somebody who's got a year's Dang worth it. of training. I love it when people get thrown <laughs> under the bus. It makes – well, yeah. like I, I really want to provide – just like Howard Fran tries to do this. He tries yeah. to get specifics out of people. Like who yeah. would you recommend and who wouldn't you recommend? And, and you don't want to burn So let's just say if you've got feelings. a local person that doesn't have a business background – um, that works for a national chain okay. that has a year worth of experience, they're never going to be able to figure this out because okay. the P&L, the accounting that comes to the broker is just given to him from the dentist. And the dentist probably doesn't have his financials organized well <laughs> enough. It'll There will be one line item on the uh, income statement that says payroll. Okay. And everyone's compensation gets lumped into that one line. Okay. So it's like, well, what's hygiene? I don't know. We don't break that out. Um, okay. okay. What's front office comp? Uh, we don't know. We don't break that out. What's the doctor getting paid? It's in the pay. It's all in payroll. Right. So you might see like, 
you know, a million in collections and you might see 500,000 in payroll or 600,000 payroll. We don't know no how clue. what's bro- broken out. So if you go to like whoever's cutting the payroll, whoever the payroll person is, like whoever's making the payroll checks and you say, can I get a year to date payroll stub history of everyone in the practice? And then have the doctor write by the side of the name of the person, what role they had. Okay. And then you can just add it up and go, okay, now I know which role everyone has. And now I can, then I can go to the the office manager and I could say, can you give me a day sheet by provider, a okay. production report by provider? And it'll show this hygienist produced this mm. and this hygienist produced this and this doctor produced this. And then you can just say, okay, here's my, you add up the hygiene production numbers from what the office manager gives you. And then you add up what the payroll was that you got from the payroll person and, and you just can see. divide it. Yeah. Okay. And that's the easiest way I would do it. And that, that, that way you can say, you know, what should my, what are my, what's my real hygiene cost? Um, and then the, the front desk cost too, you know, you, you got that other kind of component. Sure. Um, that you, you want, you want to see between, like in my experience, I would try to get all of the payroll for everyone, including benefits and everything. Make sure it's, you know, 25% or less okay. for all that stuff. So if if it's starting to, I mean, I've got clients including under 20. Including hygiene or not including, including hygiene. hygiene? Including hygiene. So if, if I, I've got people that, you know, you'll see all of their overheads under 20%, you know, so you got 20% going to people or less, the doctor's getting 30, the rest of the overhead's, you know, 20, and then there's, you know, 20 or 30 left over. It, the, the higher the total percentage of non-doctor payroll, I mean, if you're getting to 30, north of 30, 33, 35, that's just a really bloated practice with people getting used to getting paid way too much. If the total non-doctor salaries are no, south of 20%, I mean, you, you're, you're probably in a good starting place to come in there and, and you should have good bonusing, like, you know, not like lots of money, just a good program where people feel like they're getting rewarded for they things. They feel it's and, fair and incentivized yeah, and, and motivating. Good and, Christmas presents sure. and birthdays and take people out to lunch on their birthdays and take care of your staff. But, you know, compensation really needs to be reasonable for your size. And that's just probably the number one thing I would care about if I was acquiring a practice. I'm, awesome. Honestly, it's the number awesome. one thing I would care about. I would just look at it and go, am I going to be dealing with people that are getting used to getting paid too much and I can't come in and change it because that's okay. the number one complaint I hear like five years in is like, I know I'm blowing through payroll, but I can't tell right. Tom. I can't my I'd have to rehire everyone because at yeah, this and I, point. And I can't do that. Right. And so you just have bloated payroll. So you, you overpaid for a practice by a lot because when you value a business, there's two ways to value it. One is based on top line sales, right? right. So if I'm doing a million in collections, and I paid a million for that, that would be a pretty expensive acquisition for a general dentist. Okay. Like a one times collections, right. 100% of collections. That's, that'd be a, that's that'd on be the a high lot. end. Yeah. Right. But, but if that practice had 35% profit at the bottom because the doctor was so – he paid himself 30% and there was still, still 30, another 30 left over. Then maybe that isn't too expensive. Right. Because his payroll is so efficient and his staff's just doing a lot. They're producing a ton – um, they're, they're, they've got fewer patients, higher end procedures. Maybe it is worth paying more. Um, because I, I, I can, I'm going to make just in profit. I'm going to make up that whole purchase price in like two years Okay. where another practice you, you, that's doing a million collections is selling for, you know, 500,000. Right. And you buy that. And in, in, in that scenario, you, there's zero profit, maybe. Maybe the doctor is getting paid 20% on his production, and then there's zero profit left. Hmm. I mean, even though you feel like that's a, a better deal, it's not, it's not, right? So when you value a business, there's usually you look at both the percentage of the total sales, yep. and then you look at a, a multiple of what the profit is at the bottom. So if I'm doing a million in collections and I have 200000 of profit, you know, I, I, I want to make sure that that – that I know what that multiple is that I'm paying on both the profit on the yeah. bottom and the top line sales. So that's a lot to digest, but no, that's more important. This than this is like the exact content that I want because I feel like how in dental school am I ever going to get access to that sort of information? And then I'm looking at two practices that are both million dollar practices and how do I tell the difference between them and mm-hmm. how is that going to affect me five years down the road? Yeah. This is the stuff that um, – 
just like isn't easy knowledge to come by no. if you only ever do one of these in your life. If you only ever buy maybe I know. one or two and practices. It's so it's like the we talk about it here. Like the reason you hire a financial advisor um, is because they'll help you avoid um, like four mistakes in your life. That's it. Okay. Like how to invest your money. Yeah. Which, which like practice probably to buy, how to finance it, um, how to pay off your debt, which house to buy. Um, that's basically the big choices. Yeah. And so if you have someone, I mean, there, there's more than that, but you know, there's a handful sure. of choices every year, like maybe two or three Yeah. where you probably won't even remember like that, that was a trigger for you. That's the sad part is like, advice gets very little um, value anymore. Yeah. Like, uh, people don't value advice. They don't value consulting. They don't value sure. advice because it's all free. You can go on the internet and get right. any advice you want All these nothing. podcasts that are coming out. It's man. completely free. And so, you know, in order for people to, to – and, and when people get free advice so often, they also discount the trajectory that that advice had on their life. Right. You know, like I, I've had um, – I had a mar- I have a marketing agency that I've paid a little bit of money to to help me kind of figure out like some strategic things that I was going to do. Yeah. And some of the- none of those things actually ended up working. Okay? Like Okay. But then there was one thing they told me out of like probably, you know, let's call it $100,000 that I've spent. Sure. That probably changed the trajectory of my business in a really really important way. Yeah. And it was that I should probably change the name of my company from Acquire Wealth to okay. DennisAdvisors.com. Okay. And I was like, oh, it's too big of a pain. Like, I don't want to do yeah, that. It was like a hassle. side piece of advice. Yeah. And when I looked back at all the tactics that we tried to implement to grow, none of them really ended up even, like, working. We didn't sure. even do any of them. Sure. And I'm tempted when I look at that to say that was all not wor- – like, everything was not worth it, you know, because all, all this money on these things right. we tried didn't work out. But there was this one thing they told me that was really Jeez. small. Yeah. And it looking back at it, it probably is I don't know if that's a it's probably a, a, a good seven figure difference yeah. in, in valuation that I have based on that one change. And it wasn't like something I probably would have done without that input from a few people saying, I really think this is a better choice. Yeah. I'm like, I'm not gonna call it Dennis Advisors. It's like the worst name ever. <laughs> like that's boring. <laughs> Dennis don't want me to call it the thing that they are. They that's want it awesome. to be like cool or right. something like more interesting. Right. Or, you know, you want to be more creative with your naming, you know? It wants to be something like Treadstone. Yeah, or, you know? I gave you and, – and, and, and I, I – there's 10 examples like that I could show like of decisions I've told dentists during their lives that yeah. are small. And you t- you're tempted to discount those inputs like, oh, I don't know if that really helped me. Yeah. But I do think advice is really important and I would reach out as much as I can to everyone throughout my life. And I wouldn't be afraid to like – like compensate people who you trust. Okay. Like, so, you know, so this is awesome. And I, I totally agree with this. And I also agree with that. That's why I'm addicted to podcasts. I mean, because even in the last five episodes that you've put out, mm-hmm. um, the one with I, I, the CPA, the Morgan Hammond, Morgan Hammond. Mm-hmm. And you guys were talking about, um, people with multiple practices versus people with one practice and kind of maximizing the one practice and really getting that nailed down and how people can do very well and live very comfortably from one practice yeah. if they really get the most out of it. Yeah. And I've always kind of been in this like, oh, I should do multiple practices. Yeah. I should I should be that guy who's yeah. building the empire. Feels sexy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and, and that really kind of helped me like, you know what? I, I feel good about that. It, it kind of changed. It was just this little trajectory change, yeah. that one piece of advice. Yeah. So talking about consultants and advisors, specifically in relation to acquisitions. Yeah. Who, you know, you can get these full service brokers versus hiring a CPA, hiring a lawyer, you know, doing the analysis this way or the, that way. Mm-hmm. What would you recommend in terms of key personnel to do a practice acquisition? Who would you hire? And is there anyone that you really would recommend on any of these fronts specifically? Well, I think I think the general recommendation that I would give is whoever knows the most about the market that you live in. Okay. Like, you know, the person the who's... The local market knowledge. Yeah. That's important because these are... It's like buying real estate. Like, there isn't like a national piece of advice sure. you can give out. And I really value, like, you can take... Um, a Phoenix Metro market and you'd say, well, Rich Andrus probably knows as much about leases in that market as anyone, yeah. you know, and that's the guy, yeah. you know, and there'll be a Rich Andrus, uh, there'll be a Menlo yeah. in every market. And you, you want to find that local person 
and say that, 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 that I want that knowledge to be on my team. Okay. What happens a lot of the time is um, it's compelling, I think, to feel like you can get a one-stop shop, like full-service solution from a practice uh, broker where they say we'll handle everything, like from okay. the lease to the finding to, you know, getting yeah. your tax stuff in order and finding the right, you know, professional advisors for you. And, I mean, the more services people try to deliver, the like the less effective they are at delivering those services. And so, as a, you know, I, I would just – I like to find practice brokers who have the most um, knowledge of available listings, who have the most inventory uh, under in their in their wheelhouse. Okay, um, that's much more important than a skill set uh, in terms of finding the right practice. Yeah, you're buying access to uh, connections, deal, connect, deal deal availability. Yeah, like that's what you're really paying for and. I mean, it's it's frustrating for people, I think, to pay a fee to to have someone buy something for them. Um, as a buyer, you're, it's more frustrating for sellers to pay than it right. is for buyers to pay because you don't bu- pay anything, right. you know. So, I mean, in most cases, you know, you you might pay indirectly by having someone involved, and right. might cost the might cause the price to be slightly higher. But I usually don't find that to be the case. I usually find the, the, the that without the involvement of a competent um, intermediary the price is just not really end up it doesn't end up being a fair price for either party it's okay. like kind of ends up being like one buyer is super cheap or a seller is super aggressive or you know there's not an intermediary to find the fair price your goal in an acquisition shouldn't be getting a deal it should be getting a fair value cuz a fair value is on a profitable practice on a profitable practice is the best outcome right right and 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 so if you have the more of the attitude of I want a fair valuation on a successful practice, I think that's most the most helpful. Okay. And then in terms of like building my team, I'd much I would have a CPA and bookkeeper involved um, as early as possible to sort of give me advice. I won't have any books for them to do yet, right? Sure. But I want these are going to be the people that you will be working with. Yes. Don't use your CPA that your parents filed their return with. You know, like find a dental specific CPA. Um, there's a lot of people like that, you know, around the country. And I've done podcasts with ten of them. And, and you did um that episode on building your board of advisors. Yeah. And and it's you don't need to build a whole board of advisors before you've acquired a practice. No, no. But know who those people are. Yeah. You wanna you wanna have connections and relationships and kind of have, have like here's chose the them. thing. Yeah, like I my firm, um, Dennis Advisors, like we know like so much about the choices people are gonna make. But we don't want a client yet. Like you're, it's not time for you getting out of school to hire a, a wealth manager. Right. You don't have anything. You got nothing, right? So you need to build like a basic emergency fund. Do not invest the money. Right. You know, like keep it in your bank and maybe set up an IRA or Roth. But you need to know what to do. Like you should call in right. and talk to us, right? But we've set up our business to where we, we know like a startup – isn't like a profit center yet. Like right. they don't have the needs. Um, they don't have the needs that the wealth management needs yet. Okay. So, and, and, a, and a good CPA will do the same thing. He'll say, you know, call me back in, in nine months um, when you get to this point, but don't do this, this, or this yet. Right. Um, I would know who, who's my, who, who are going to listen to that podcast. I did the nine people Dennis need to know. Yeah. And know who those people are going to be in your life. And if you're not going to hire your wealth manager for three years, that's okay. Know who it's going to be and ask them questions that will help you position yourself to, to not make the mistakes that you would make otherwise. Just okay. know who that board is, know what it looks like in three to five years, and know who the pieces are going to be on that board. But don't let someone try to fit into your board like too early, right? Like right. A, if a practice broker saying – you know, you need to retain me for, you know, your uh, onboarding, uh, your your first 12 months consulting. Like, I, I need to help you get this thing off the ground. Right. Um, make sure that that's the, really the right person to help you get that it off the ground. That you would have hired yeah, to do that. Yeah, independently. Yeah. Like, there's a person who's got to be the deal flow person who knows the inventory in the market. There's going to be a person that's best suited to help you get your operations up and running off the ground. Um, I, I like paying for small incremental things. I don't like paying a hundred thousand dollar contract. Right. Um, I, it's just a. I, I I don't mind paying even as much as seven hundred, eight hundred dollars an hour sure. if it's for three or four hours. But I don't I don't want to pay a hundred thousand unless I really trust this person. I really know them, and I've seen so many people waste so much money on 
really extended contractual relationships with full service, whatever, sure. whether it's marketing or consulting, those things can tend to be really expensive. And I'm not anti-consultant. I'm very pro-consultant. I mean, there are consultants that charge $100,000 for a service sure. that might last for a few years that I think is worth it. Um, but it's at a certain time in your career. Right. Once you have the ability to absorb that information and, and implement, and it. implement it well. Yeah. And I think a good financial advisor, a good CPA, and a capable attorney, in addition to that practice management kind of consultant that might be there post-sale right. and the practice broker, if you if you run things by them kind of in an email chain and just get their feedback, and you might have to pay a little bit to different people, you're going to get different opinions. Yeah. Sometimes it's hard to process all of it, but it'll protect you. Yeah. So I don't know. That's my thought. That's That's awesome. Um, and that's perfect because I think a lot of people get caught up in this sense that, oh, I got to hire everyone now and we got to, you know, have it all lined up and pay everyone up front and mm-hmm. it can get really expensive really quick. Yeah. So, um, so I know we're running out of time, but uh, a few more questions that I wanted to ask, maybe just one more, um, was, was lending. So you see the financial side of things and interest rates and, and all of that. Mm-hmm. How much impact does the terms and interest rate of your practice loan matter and, and getting working capital and all of these things down the road is not, is it going to set you up for success or failure, but um, you know, you get a SBA loan versus a dental specific loan. Maybe the, the terms and the, and the rate wasn't great, but that was the money you needed at that point in time to yeah. make it happen. Yeah. Um, any advice on, on getting lending and getting set up as in an acquisition? Yeah. I'd say that, what you want to do is look at the income you think you'll be earning roughly, and you don't want your debt to be – um, ideally, I would try to keep my total debt service below 40% of my gross income. Okay. So the payments that I pay on a monthly basis, I don't want those to exceed 40%. That includes my home mortgage. Okay. Everything I've got, right? And if you want to just throw rent in there, if you don't have a mortgage, sure. you can just say that's kind of what I'm trying to shoot for. But here's the trick. You can probably get underwritten for up to like 60% of your gross income. <laughs> yeah. You know, so you, a mortgage company will give you 45% of your gross income just for the house. And there's no practice. And there. there's no practice loan yet. And, and you know, most people like listening to this, if they're professionals, they'll be like, well, we underwrite this differently. You know, the practice loans don't go under personal income. And right. Yada, yada. But right. bottom line is that for normal people, like if you're making $500,000 a year, you, you, your payments are coming out of that money right. in your in your mind, right. even though it's getting written off differently at the business. It flows through, and eventually, essentially, the Affects principal you. payments come out of that income. Yeah. And so, if you've got five hundred thousand dollars income, and you've got north of two twenty thousand a month in payments between your mortgage and the practice loans, it's gonna be real tight. Okay. You know. So, what I like to do is say, you need to get to a point where, you know, I would stretch the loans out as far as I possibly can regardless of what the interest rate is until I am firmly in the driver's seat of my business. Okay. okay. Pay more interest in order to get firmly established. Okay. Meaning effective marketing, saving money for retirement, building an effective emergency fund, right. funding retirement plans, lowering my taxes, being on a normal budget, including my house and knowing what life's going to be like. Don't obsess over your wealth being eaten up by interest rates on loans because you picked a 15-year instead of a 10. Sure. I would always opt for the longest available rate as long as it wasn't um, coupled with, uh, like, you know, granted that all things are equal. Right. Pre- prepayments are the same, right? If I've got the same prepayment penalty on all my loans and right. I can pick one that's a 15 and one that's a 10, I go with the 15. Okay. Um Unless I'm walking into a situation where going a 10 year loan is only like five to 10% or right. 12% of my It's going to work out for you. No yeah. big deal. But if it's starting and for most people, like I just met with an orthodontist recently who's going to buy a practice that was, you know, probably, probably going to pay 780 for it. And it's only collecting like 650 and he's being forced into like a seven year loan. Okay. And he's got it just bought a house. Okay. Right. So his debt to income ratio is like 55%. Mm. And that's before taxes will even like, you sure. know, and what happens is those first few years, it'll feel fine if you pick that lower rate. Because you'll look at it and go, well, I'm going to be making so much money and the bank says it's fine. And those first few years when you buy a practice, you're, you're, 
if you look at your income in a year, just think of your income and divide it into four buckets. You have taxes, spending, debt, and savings. Okay. You can save the money. You can spend it. You can pay taxes with it, or you can pay debt with it. Those okay. are the only four places it can go. In the first few years, the taxes one, like let's just say it's 25% in each bucket, just for simplicity's sure. sake. The taxes one in the first few years will be like zero. Mm. So you'll you'll feel like you have more money left over. And then the tax- you have all these write-offs have, and all these advantages. Uh-huh. And because you bought this thing and it gets written off and it wipes your taxes out okay. for a few years. Then the taxes will start picking up. But usually what happens is people get into their practice, they go six months, and it's like, ah, oh, things are pretty comfortable. I have a bunch of money left over. But they're not paying any taxes yet. So they go by the house, they start living, they get the cars they want, and things get normal. And then over the next three years, it just slowly starts. They start saving some money. They're like, I can even save money into my retirement account. And then the taxes take 20 to 25% of the income away that they thought they had. And it wasn't happening at the beginning. So on 250000 a year, five grand a month is now going to tax, right? right. And so now you got five grand a month that like, it's just disappeared. And you used to have it all. And you built your budget around – not having taxes because no one like consciously knows all this stuff when they go buy it. They just buy it, they get in there, and then all of a sudden they have money left over of right. some amount. Right. And they start living on what's ever there or buying some things. But taxes don't start showing up until a few years in. So I would say that's the that's the myth of getting a lower interest rate and a shorter loan. Sure. Because you really need those longer terms to be in place when the taxes kick in. Mm. In, the, in the, the next two or three years, you'll get a 10 year or seven year loan and feel like things are fine because sure. you don't have any taxes. And then when taxes kick in, it'll feel really tight. Ugh. And yeah. then you'll be like, we can't even do anything. And we're not having, we're, you know, can't, I'm starting to like see my bank accounts like decline and I'm not building up cash anymore. And right. then you won't be able to market effectively. Then you'll cut your bills on essential things like, you know, paying your office manager that decent bonus for all the AR that she was keeping down. Yeah. And, you just start doing things that are stupid because you want any cash flow. <laughs> and so in my my opinion, I just don't I, – I, I don't – I would always push back and try to get graduated payments from a lender or a longer term. Okay. And sometimes lenders don't have a 15-year loan available. They'll only have like a 10-year. Okay. And the deal's like they'll try, someone's trying to convince you that only this one bank's the only one that's willing to do it. And you should shop – like there's 30 banks. I mean you should be shopping like – Live Oak and Chase and, you know, U.S. Bank and any local bank and, uh, you know, any national B, B of A, Wells. Um, all you know, the standard dental ones yeah. that you hear of. And you should then- shop them all, figure out who's got the longest terms with the lowest prepayment penalty for your amount. Even if the interest rate's higher, I still probably go with that. Because, huh. pres- I mean, think about it. Like, I'm saving 1% interest on some loans. But if I had two grand a month extra because of that, to put towards marketing that I desperately needed. Right. And that's the only way that I have that extra two grand. Right. Then it's way worth it to me than because uh, interest on a loan, 1% on $500,000 is 5,000 bucks a year. But that doesn't really cost me five grand. 1% interest doesn't. If it's the difference, I mean, if that's the difference in the 10 year loan and the 15, it costs me uh, 5,000 before t- taxes, but I get to write that off. Right. So after taxes, that only cost me like three grand. Mm. So it's like 250 bucks a month difference maybe to have $2,000 a month more in cash flow that I might need to be able to spend on hiring the right office manager or expanding or marketing effectively or saving money for retirement. Like what if I could take that $2,000 a month that I save and put it into a 401k? And that's the only way I would have had that extra money. Right. Then I can deduct $24,000 a year, which saves me – you know, 10 grand a year in taxes. Right. And I'm only, it's only costing me 200 bucks a month in cost to save 10 grand a year in taxes. It's like you're, you're tripping over dollars to pick up pennies rather than just giving yourself flexibility. And as long as there's no prepayment penalty on that debt, then you can pay it off as soon as we have the growth. As as soon as everything's looking good and, and, and things are flowing the way they should. So I don't know. It's not an, it's not an easy thing. Like always get the longest terms and always stretch your debt out. But I, in general, in general, that's the right answer. It's going to give you a whole lot more power. I'd much rather have that than meet the guy that's like, dude, I'm tight. So tight. What do I do? And I'm like, you're making 500,000 a year. Like there's no problem here. You're just like, you got your mortgage on a 10 year loan and your practices trying to pay off in seven. Right. You have no cash flow. You're building wealth. It just doesn't feel like it. 
right? Your house is building equity like crazy and your practice, you're building equity like crazy. So technically you're probably building wealth at an effective pace, right? but it just doesn't feel good because there's no liquidity and, and it's not, a, it's not as efficient as it, as it would be otherwise. And, and there's no flexibility to build the wealth by, by spending on the right things, things within the practice. Yeah. You just don't have the, the flexibility. So I'd rather take a higher interest rate and a longer term loan any day than I'd do it right now. Like if I could get more financing to continue to expand at a faster pace, I would do that. Like right. I, I think that as long as the practice isn't over leveraged, like I don't want to have more than probably 50% LTV. Okay. So if the practice is worth a million, I don't want to have a lot more than 500. Okay. You know, uh, that, that's, you know, that's a good goal. Right. When you buy it right out of the gate, you're going to be way more levered than that. So at the point where you get down to a point where you're about at a 50% LTV or 40% LTV, meaning, you know, you got 400,000 of debt on a million dollar asset. Right. Then I don't know if I ever care if you pay that off. Like right. I, it's not really a thing where I'm like, Oh, the guy who pays that off is going to be the successful person. Right, he's he's going to get the gold star from Dave Ramsey. Yeah, because I'm like, well, life. you know, the other person's going to, you know, you, the other practice is just going to continue to keep that debt at 400 or 500, and they're going to have newer equipment. They'll have a better smelling practice. Right? <laughs> I don't know. Replace the carpet. Yeah, they're going to replace things more frequently. They're going to be able to market more effectively, preserve their brand. Or someone else is like obsessed over getting that practice loan paid off. Yeah, and I'm like, for what? You like, you're just. You're just building wealth in a different place, right? Right. It's great to get it paid off if, like, you have plenty of money for retirement and you're just like, I don't – I want a guaranteed 6% return by paying off this debt this year. Right. Great. Let's pay it off, especially if you're, like, everything else is dialed in. Right. It's just too many people feel like that's the key to that's, financial that's freedom. That's number one and you yeah, got to start there. It's like there's so many skills you need uh, first and I, you need cash to do anything in a business. I've spent I have I have lost more money on marketing tactics that didn't work. You know, I've lost money on staff turnover. I've trained people for years that end up having to go a different place, you know, or I have to let go. Sure. Like you're going to waste money. It's going to happen. Right. And you're never going to spend it perfectly in a business that you're trying to grow. So the more of it you can have so that you can do those tests early in your career and learn what it's like to make the right marketing decisions, the right hires. You know, that's the best way to, to, to run a business. Don't get, don't think that you're going to get away with running a dental practice, not losing money on tests. Like you have to test things and you need to be okay with having $5,000 go up in smoke because it just didn't work. Right. Don't waste money, but, you know, research the expenses you're going to make as diligently as you can. But I like having the capital available to, to do that testing and, and, um, I like to having cash in the bank and a lot of liquidity. Um, like right now, I have debts that I could pay off in my business that feel good to me to pay them off. Sure. But I have a lot of cash available in my savings and retirement investment accounts, and it makes me feel like a stronger business owner. And I can tackle things with a lot more confidence. I'd be like, hey, my staff tells me this is a really good thing we should do in the practice. I'd be like, that makes sense. I think I like the research that we've done. Seems like the right provider. We've got the right resources. Let's spend seven grand on that. It doesn't feel painful at all, right? Yeah. And, and it's just because – not because it's not a lot of money to me. It still is. I mean that's a lot of money. But when I look at what I've got in liquidity, I'm able to make those investments consciously and not be stressed. And it's the debt that I have that allows me to – be confident as a business owner. And my staff salaries are more stable because of it. Right. I'm able to give people decent Christmas presents. I'm able to like, <laughs> you important. know, feed people well. Right. And, and, you know, grow the business the right way and invest in my clients and invest in our technology. And if you don't, if you, you can cash strap yourself and just hurt your customers, you hurt your patients. If you just take all your cash and, and put pay down debt with it. I mean, so you gotta be, this, it's gotta be balanced. This, this anyway. like for me, the way that my mindset has shifted in investing in business ownership, um, personal finance since listening to your podcast and talking with you has been liquidity. Like yeah. you're preaching the gospel of liquidity. Yeah. And, and I feel like that's a business mindset that dentists need to grasp and wrap their minds around and really embrace rather than debt aversion yeah. Um, and, and how that all relates to this acquisitions and that idea of extending your term out, all things, other things being equal, even if it costs you a few interest points, yeah. it's going to give you that liquidity and that flexibility. 
this this has been really good. Okay, this man. has been well, exactly thanks. what I was looking for. Um, a different perspective on all of these things, but you're seeing the the effects of this in dentist lives down the road, you know, five years, 10 years down the road from this one decision they made of acquiring this practice or that practice. Um, and I think you, we've given them a few more tools that they can analyze practices from and think about things in a different way. Cool. This has been awesome. Well, thanks, Richard, man. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate you having me on. And we're, we're going to have to get you back again. If, hey, let's if, do it once a year when you uh, come down to the <laughs> studio. Okay? Perfect. Okay. Th- thanks, man. Yep. Thank you. Hey, take care. Okay, I hope you guys enjoyed that. We've got a lot more where that's coming from. We actually have a few people, including Dr. Hunter Smith, who are experts at analyzing and evaluating practices. So if you have a practice you're looking at right now, you can reach out to me, Richard, at sharedpractices.com, or even Hunter himself. Let me get his email. Okay, it's Hunter A. Smith dds at gmail.com and all of that will be in the show notes if you email him or i later on in the season we're going to analyze a few of these these uh practices on an episode and we want some we want some real data some stuff that you actually care about lastly uh leave us a review share us with a friend and reach out to both spear education and blue sky bio and let them know that you're listening and that you are now interested in in what they have to offer We have 10 episodes recorded and we'll be releasing regularly from now on on Friday morning. So we will talk to you next week on the Shared Practices podcast.